Okay, hello, everybody. Welcome back. So we are moving towards the end of a reproduction cycle. First half of this course is what happens when viruses get into cells. And the second half is gonna be about when they get into a host. Well, you need this first part to understand the second part, at least in my opinion. Today, we're gonna to talk about DNA replication. Last time we talked about RNA, and this time DNA. And so these are some of the viruses we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, here are group one, viruses with double-stranded DNA. Group two, viruses with single-stranded DNA. Uh, we're not gonna talk about hepatitis B virus, even though the genome is DNA, because it has reverse transcriptase in its replication cycle. So we're gonna talk about that on Monday. So as you know, just like for RNA viruses, to make more DNA viruses, you have to make DNA. And so that's the, the subject we're gonna talk about today, how that is accomplished. And remember, DNA replication is always delayed after infection. It typically happens in the late phase of an infection. And that's because you need to make the proteins that are required for DNA synthesis. Many viral genomes are small. They don't encode all the proteins needed for DNA synthesis. So they have to be made first. That's why we talked about transcription first because you have to make mRNA to make a protein. But you will see at the end of today that not all cells that are infected are dividing in your body. And so that's not good because a non-dividing cell is not making DNA, so all the machinery is turned off. And that is not good for a DNA virus. We're gonna see how that's dealt with today. So there are universal rules for DNA replication, just as there were for uh, RNA. They're very similar. And the top we have our template and a primer. And again, uh, we have template-directed DNA synthesis and the, the triphosphates are incorporated uh, in a synthesized in a five to three prime direction. The triphosphates, of course, are incorporated by the template, by directed by the template. And the, the DNA synthesis we're gonna talk about today is called semi-conservative. It's nothing to do with politics. It is about, it's the name that was given for replication where both strands are copied. Right, so here on the top, semi-conservative DNA replication, we have a green and a red strand. Oh, sorry, we're, st we're starting in the middle there. Um, this is actually pictured for RNA. The colors are RNA colors. They should be blue, but it's the same principle. Semi-conservative replication, both strands are copied. Whereas conservative replication, only one strand is copied. And there's some examples of that, but we're not gonna we're not gonna talk about them today. So semi-conservative replication. And uh, DNA synthesis begins at what we call origins of replication. We're gonna talk about those quite a bit today. They, DNA synthesis, of course, the enzyme is the DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, but you also need other proteins, what we call accessory proteins. And finally, it can depend on a primer or be primer independent. For many years in this course, I said DNA synthesis is primer dependent. And lo and behold, a few years ago, uh, that changed. This, this is how science is. It's not always written in stone. But here is an ex experiment showing a primer independent DNA polymerase. So overturning the dogma that all DNA polymerases require a primer. Here are um, DNA polymerases from two organisms. We have T7 bacteriophage DNA polymerase, and then we have uh, a bacteriophage called NRS1 that infects bacteria that grow all the way at the bottom of the ocean near those vents, you know, those things that are smoking all the time, and uh, lots of weird creatures grow around them, and included amongst them are bacteria, and of course, when they're bacteria, they're bacteriophages. And so uh, this is an experiment looking at triphosphate incorporation into a product with time. 
So here, T7 DNA polymerase without a primer in orange, you make nothing because this is a primer dependent enzyme. You add a primer and a primer again is nothing more than a short series of bases which base pair with the template. They give the polymerase an anchor. Now the T7 with a primer works beautifully. And then we have the bacteriophage NRS1 with and without a primer, you get the same amount of incorporation. A primer is not needed. So this was the first demonstration that not all DNA polymerases are primer dependent. You know, it just is a matter of what you've looked at. You can make statements that like all DNA polymerases need a primer, but if you haven't looked at every DNA polymerase on the planet, you, you could be wrong. And this is a great example of that. So DNA polymerases, their structure looks like that of the other kinds of polymerase that we talked about. So here on the left, the red one is a DNA polymerase. It, uh, the, the enzyme looks like a right hand with a fingers and a thumb domain. The active site is in the palm of the protein. That yellow there is, the, is one of the two beta strands in the active site. And just like for RNA, there is um, coordination of magnesium. Um, so uh, the DNA polymerase is different from poliovirus, RNA polymerase on the bottom here, because for poliovirus, RNA polymerase, the finger and thumb touched to encircle the active site. They don't do that for DNA polymerase. It's an open configuration. And the mechanism of synthesis is very similar for RNA polymerase. It's a two metal catalyzed synthesis where you have a template, complementary bases are added, and then two aspartates in the active site, sorry, at the top, in the active site of the polymerase, coordinate two magnesium ions, which in turn hold uh, the um, phosphates so that the reaction can occur that takes off two and, and joins the third phosphate to the next base. Same, same mechanism as we talked about for RNA polymerase, two metal catalysis. So what does the host cell provide in a virus infected cell? Now remember viral DNA replication always requires at least one virus protein to be made, sometimes many as we will see today. That's one reason why it's delayed. The other reason, of course, is that before you start encapsidating uh, genomes, you need to make the genomes and then make the capsid proteins. But the main reason why DNA synthesis is delayed is because you have to make proteins first. Viruses with small genomes require more host proteins. As you'll see today, we're gonna look at some viruses where one protein only is provided for DNA synthesis. The rest comes from the host. Viruses with larger genomes can make more of the proteins that are involved in DNA synthesis. And in fact, pox viruses and Mimi viruses, really big viruses with big genomes, encode all the proteins that are needed for DNA synthesis. In fact, these viruses reproduce in the cytoplasm of the cell. And so there's nothing there in the way of DNA replication machinery because in the cell, everything having to do with DNA replication is in the nucleus. So those viruses that choose to replicate in the cytoplasm have to make everything uh, on their own. And the DNA polymerase, its origin is interesting to look at. The small DNA viruses do not encode a DNA polymerase. The papillomaviruses, the polyomaviruses, the parvoviruses, we'll, we'll see those today to, to jog your memory on what they are. They don't encode DNA polymerases. In fact, all they encode is one viral protein, which we say orchestrates the host. In other words, it's going to trick the host into copying their genomes. We'll see how that works today. On the other hand, the large DNA viruses encode most of their own replication systems, the herpes viruses and the adenoviruses, most of their own. The pox viruses, pretty much the whole thing because again, they're in the cytoplasm. So they have to encode the entire replication system. So viral proteins involved in replication. Again, the small viral genomes don't encode these, but uh, if the larger ones will encode the DNA polymerase and some accessory proteins that are needed. Uh, an origin binding protein, We'll see what that is and what it does. Those, those can be encoded by uh, 
uh, the small DNA genomes, as well as helicase. So sometimes the origin binding protein has a helicase built into it. A helicase will unwind the DNA just to do that in order to get it replicated. Exonucleases to correct any errors that may occur. And then, of course, we have to make triphosphates. We have to make the DNTPs. And so there are a host of enzymes that are needed for that, thymidine kinase, ribonucleotide reductase, DUTPase, or some of them that are needed. Some viral genomes encode those. But for the smaller ones, again, they come from uh, the host. All right, question number one is, which statement about viral DNA synthesis is not correct? Large DNA viruses encode many proteins involved in DNA synthesis. Small DNA viruses encode at least one protein involved in DNA synthesis. Viral DNA replication is always delayed after infection because it requires the synthesis of at least one viral protein. And finally, all DNA polymerases are primer dependent, which is wrong. Okay, most of you have got uh, the right answer, which is D, all DNA polymerases are primer dependent. That's not correct. Remember, there's, there's one that has been shown to be primer independent. All the other things are right. Uh, large DNA viruses encode many proteins involved in DNA synthesis. Small DNAs encode at least one. And DNA replication is always delayed because you need to make that one viral protein. Now we have these viruses that we're talking about today, their DNAs are different. They're structurally very diverse. And we're gonna talk about today uh, how to accommodate that diversity. We're gonna talk about these, all these DNAs shown on here. We have adenovirus associated virus two, which is a parvovirus, single-stranded DNA with weird uh, hairpins at the end. Uh, SV40, which is a polyomavirus with a double-stranded circular DNA. Also, papillomaviruses have similar genome. Adenovirus herpes simplex, linear double-stranded DNAs. And then finally, uh, pox viruses, which is double-stranded DNA, but the ends are covalently linked. So they're not unpaired as they are for adenovirus and herpes simplex. So there are two general mechanisms of double-stranded DNA synthesis. They're shown here. They are a replication fork or strand displacement. The replication fork is observed with papillomas, polyomas, herpes, and retroviral proviruses. So the, as we'll see next time, the retrovirus DNA is integrated into the cell DNA. That's called a provirus. And that's done by a replication fork. In fact, our DNA replication occurs by a replication fork. And the key here is that both strands are copied at the same time. You can see in the picture, the new DNA, which is some kind of red or orange color, is being synthesized on both. And the primers are RNA primers. The RNA primers are shown in green here on the slide. So replication fork it uses RNA primers and both strands are being copied at the same time. It was actually the first to be discovered. It was called a replication fork because it's like a fork in the road, right? When you see a fork in the road, take it. Um, and that's what that looks like. But the other one you could say looks like a fork also, but that was discovered many years later. So it was called strand displacement and it's different mechanistically. So we see this with adenoviruses and parvoviruses. It is never RNA prime. And you know, I say never, but who knows in a future course, version of this course that may change, but for now, never RNA prime. The primer, there is a primer, you need primers for these, is either a protein or a DNA hairpin. We'll look at that today. And what happens here is DNA synthesis occurs just on one strand. The second strand is displaced, as you can see in the picture. And then that second strand eventually is completely displaced and then it's copied separately. So they're not copied at the same time. So replication fork strand displacement. I'll point those out as we go through uh, the different examples. And the other issue that you need to think about is what we call the five prime end problem. And that is when you have a linear double-stranded DNA, if you need primers, RNA primers to prime synthesis. So there on the left is a double-stranded DNA and we have RNA primers 
at, at the end for both strands. We have one for the top strand, the RNA primers at the three prime end of the top and the three prime end of the minus. So those RNA primers serve to prime DNA synthesis, but you can't leave RNA primers in the DNA when you're done. You have to get rid of them and you have to fill in the gap. But when the primers are at the end of the DNA, you can't fill in the gap because there's nowhere to put a primer because DNA synthesis requires a primer. So that's the five prime end problem that has to be solved for all DNA synthesis. And we're gonna see how it's solved uh, by viruses today. Our DNA, by the way, doesn't solve the five prime end problem. It gets shorter and shorter as you age. So you start off with big ends on our DNA and they get shorter and shorter and shorter. And some of the symptoms of senescence, getting old, have to do with losing your, the ends of your DNA. We're gonna actually come back to that uh, next time. So let's start with SV40, circular double-stranded DNA, a single origin of replication. An origin is again where DNA synthesis begins. And what happens here is that DNA synthesis begins at the origin and it proceeds in both directions. This is bi-directional DNA synthesis, all right? And you can see that if we linearize the circle, just so it's easier to look at, DNA synthesis begins at the origin the origin gets melted, the two strands are separated. We'll see how that works in a minute. And then DNA synthesis occurs in both directions. It's bi-directional. And DNA synthesis was studied first with SV40 many years ago because you could easily purify the DNA before recombinant DNA was available. You could just make a lot of virus and purify the DNA and you could add it to an extract of mammalian cells and watch DNA replication occur. You, can't, you couldn't do that with chromosomal DNA. So viruses were very important for our understanding of DNA synthesis. And at the top is a series of electron micrograph photographs to show you DNA synthesis happening on SV40 templates. And so what, what was done here is to cut the circle with a restriction enzyme and cut it so that the origin would be near one end, right? So then you, you incubate that cut DNA. So in the leftmost panel A, uh, you can see a, a linear piece of DNA and it's now replicating. We're taking pictures at different times after replication. You see in the first picture, there's a little, little bit of a bubble uh, right there near one end. That's the origin of replication. And the bubble shows you that the strands have separated, they're beginning to reproduce. The bubble gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's, it's getting bigger on both sides. And you can tell that by using the linear DNA as a reference. You can see it's not going in one direction or the other, it's going in both directions. Bidirectional replication. That was the evidence for that. And here's a diagram of what's going on there. We call this not only bidirectional, but it's semi discontinuous, right? What does that mean? It's continuous on one strand and discontinuous on the other. So if you open up the origin, here's the origin of replication. We've opened it up a bit. We've already made DNA on both strands. And again, this DNA synthesis occurs by replication fork, which means it needs a primer and both strands are being replicated at the same time. So let's see, at the origin, we've put down a RNA primer, you can see it in green. And then the polymerase starts to polymerize in a five to three prime direction. It's the right direction. So it just keeps going. And as the bubble gets bigger, as the strands denature, the polymerase just keeps on polymerizing. It makes one continuous strand. That's what we mean by continuous DNA synthesis. And there are two continuous DNA strands here. There's one on the top strand and there's one on the, minus, uh, the bottom strand in the other direction. Now, if you want to copy these other portions, say upstream of, the, of this origin, you have to do semi-discontinuous replication because these have to be made in a five to three prime direction, but you can't start to initiate each of these until you've denatured more of the template. So right now we could make three RNA primed pieces of DNA. 
And then we can make a fourth when the bubble gets bigger and a fifth and so on. But because it's five to three prime direction, that's the only way it works. You can't do it continuously. So the polymerase adds an RNA primer. So imagine this bubble to be very small. There's a little bit of space there. Polymerase adds an RNA primer. The polymerase makes DNA and that's all it can do. And then uh, when the bubble gets a little bigger, it can put a second primer and a third and a fourth. And that happens on both strands as well. Eventually, <clears throat> all these uh, primers are gonna be removed and the gaps are gonna be filled in because, for example, if you remove one of these RNA primers, the polymerase could use the upstream piece of DNA as a primer to fill in the gap. So eventually you get two strands of DNA without any RNA in it, and all the pieces are ligated, they're covalently joined together so that it's all, it's two pieces of DNA. Now, <clears throat> here is the solution to the end problem. There are no ends. These are circles, right? So there's not gonna be an end. Wherever the last piece of DNA is primed, there's gonna be a piece of DNA upstream so you can take out the RNA primer and fill in the gap. So you have no five prime end problem. So this is solution number one to the five prime end problem. Let's take a close look at the origin, just so you get a feeling for what it's like. It's pretty complex. Uh, so here at the bottom is uh, the origin of SV40. That is double-stranded DNA. We have, this is where base one is and 5,243, right there, the two of them right next to each other. And the uh, origin is shown with the, with the dotted lines there. That's, that's comprising the origin. Um, I'm sorry, the top is actually the, the, dis, the, the far away look at the viral DNA. And then we're expanding the origin on the bottom there with the dotted lines, all right? So the top is the uh, 10,000 foot view of the DNA. The origin would be right there around 1 slash 5243. And you can see on the left is the early promoter. Remember there are two promoters here going in two different directions. That's the early promoter, and then there's a late promoter going the other direction. And then we've expanded the origin below. And you can see that there are some repeated sequences, 27 base pair palindrome, and there are AT rich elements. AT is, is a base pair, A bound to T. And this is a pretty weak base pair compared to GC, so it's easy to denature. So origins tend to be rich in AT base pairs so they can be easily denatured for DNA synthesis. Um, then you have what are called LT binding sites. LT is large T antigen, which is the one protein encoded in the SV40 genome that gets DNA synthesis started. So we're gonna see how that works in a moment. So the origin has a number of unique sequences, AT rich sequences, large T uh, binding sites. And you can see it overlaps with uh, the early promoter. All right, so here's the, the beginning steps of DNA replication. And I want you to, you don't need to know the details, you need to know the overview here. What is happening? So on the top, we start with SV40 DNA. Remember, this virus has now infected the cell. The DNA is in the nucleus. Early transcription occurs to make large T mRNA, which is then shipped out into the cytoplasm. The protein is made, large T comes back in the nucleus, and there it is, that orange protein, LT, large T. So there's the origin right in the middle there with the AT rich regions. Six copies of large T bind on either side of the origin, and they denature the DNA. So they bind specifically to the origin, they denature the DNA, as you can see in the last panel here, and then a cellular protein called RPA comes in and binds to the single-stranded DNA to keep them separate, because, because uh, large T is gonna move away as the bubble gets bigger, and so you wanna keep those regions single-stranded. So uh, large T is binding the DNA, and it's melting the DNA, so we say it has Helica helicase is another word for an enzyme activity that can denature or unwind DNA, right? So that's a very important function of large T, to find the origin and to denature it. So you can imagine, you infect a cell with SV40, a few viral DNAs maybe are gonna get in the nucleus. The nucleus is full of cellular DNA. There's no way that 
the cellular apparatus is going to pay any attention to SV40. However, with a large T, large T is going to attract pieces of the cellular apparatus. And the first piece is this uh, RPA, which keeps the, the origin uh, denatured. All right. Uh, then the next step is uh, that the uh, enzymes are going to start coming in to make the RNA primers. So the, the enzyme that makes primers is called Paul alpha primase. It will make both RNA primers and short uh, DNA primers. And this enzyme uh, binds RPA. So RPA is that protein that came in to keep the strands separated. That protein will now recruit in the primase, which starts to make RNA primers. We do the leading strands first. The, those are the easiest. And they make short pieces of DNA as well. And the bubble gets bigger and bigger. So large T has brought in the RPA, and then RPA is bringing in the enzymes needed for uh, DNA synthesis. So the bubble gets larger and larger, and eventually uh, you can and eventually another polymerase comes in, polymerase epsilon, which will make long DNA. So the primase only makes very short DNAs as well as the primer. Another polymerase, polymerase epsilon, comes in, recruited again to RPA, and it makes longer DNAs. So then we can start making the, uh, the, the lagging strands. On the, other, on the other strand, we have leading and, and lagging strands now. Here it's leading. We make lagging strands. Uh, on the other, and then uh, the RNA is removed. So RNA H is an enzyme that will take out those RNA primers, and then a DNA ligase will ligate the ends uh, of the DNAs together once they're filled in by polymerase. And so this is how the replication circle gets bigger and bigger. The T antigens move down uh, with this growing fork. And this is a kind of a close-up view of the of the replication machine, one end of that fork, if you will. And you can see synthesis happening on both strands. Uh, in one case, uh, the, the lagging strand is happening on a piece of DNA that's looped out there. You can find really good movies of this on YouTube, by the way, which show you how fast it is. It's remarkably fast, faster than we can show in a movie, actually. Now, as this is happening, as the bubble is growing and the, the DNA is being denatured, the rest of the DNA, remember this is closed circular DNA, the rest of the DNA is getting twisted. Uh, and eventually, and that's shown here in the middle, it becomes overwound, kind of like you guys when you're you know, approaching an exam, you get overwound, or some of you maybe, and you need to release tension because otherwise, eventually the enzymes stop. They can't move into this overwound area. And so there is a solution called topoisomerase. Topoisomerase, there are two of them in the cell, one or two. They, they nick one strand of the DNA. It's like cutting a rubber band that's been twisted up. Boom, it, it suddenly uncoils, it relaxes, and now DNA synthesis can proceed. So again, the twisting of the DNA caused by denaturation of a circular DNA can be relaxed by topoisomerase. Now, when you're done, you have two strands of DNA, but they're still like chains, right, linked together, shown there. We have two, two double-stranded DNAs, but because of the way the DNA synthesis occurs, they're, they're locked, right, like this. So what do you do? You have to cleave both strands of the DNA to separate them. That's called strand resolution. It's done by topoisomerase 2, and that will cleave uh, both strands and release uh, the two circles. They have to be ligated together, of course, but now you have two independent circles. That's the only way you can get around it if you're using a circular double-stranded DNA template. Right? So that's how we replicate SV40 DNA. Next question. This SV40 genome is circular double-stranded DNA. Which statement about its replication is correct? Viral T antigen binds and unwinds the ORI. Replication is bidirectional from a single ORI. The five prime end problem is solved, has leading and lagging strand synthesis, all of the above. Which statement is correct? All of these are correct. <coughs> uh, T, T antigen binds and unwinds the ORI. Replication is bidirectional from a single ORI. Five prime end problem is solved because we have a, a circular molecule and 
leading and lagging. All right, parvoviruses have this unusual genome where it's mostly single-stranded, but the ends are these unusual, what we call T structures, and they, they are basically a base-paired region of the DNA. So here's the sequence of one end of the DNA at the bottom, and there's the three prime hydroxyl. And you can see uh, the DNA is base pairing with itself to form this T structure. So if you denatured it, if you separated the strands and stretched it out, this would be the three prime end of the DNA. But as it exists in the virus, it, both uh, ends have this base pairing capability. So that's what they look like. And, and as you will see there, that's important for DNA synthesis. The genome is relatively simple. It encodes two open reading frames, one for what's called a rep protein, which is basically going to be a T antigen like protein, an origin binding protein. And then CAP is the encodes for the capsid proteins of the virus. So, how do we reproduce this? Hopefully, you can see this. So, uh, here is our DNA genome as it comes in. And the, the ends are marked with letters. And, and so, A, B, C, A prime, D prime. A prime is complementary to A, and you know, C prime is complementary to C. So you can see that we have inverted terminal repeats here, which means we have A, B, C, A, D, A, B, C, A, D, the same sequence repeated and it's inverted, so it's going in from both ends. Uh, and the, they, they're complementary to what's downstream. So the A and the A prime form that base paired structure that I just showed you. Same thing at the other end. In the cell, as this DNA comes in, it's recognized as damaged by the host cell because it has single-stranded regions. The host cell does not like to have single-stranded DNA around. And so polymerase delta actually fills it in. It's looked at as a repair reaction, a DNA repair reaction. So if any of your DNA is single-stranded, it will be repaired by this polymerase delta. And so uh, it's, not DNA it's not DNA replication because we're only filling in this one strand. But then what you have is, and by the way, that polymerization is, uses as a primer the A sequence there, the base pair. So that three prime hydroxyl is the three prime end of the primer. So the DNA has built in it its own primer. You don't need an exogenous primer because of that base pairing of the hairpin. So that's the significance of those. They serve as primers for DNA synthesis. So now we have a double-stranded molecule. At the right end, we've copied all the way to the end. So we no longer have that T structure because we've made double-stranded DNA. So now what has to be done is the DNA needs to be nicked between A prime and D. So the rep protein, which is the origin binding protein, also is a endonuclease, which means it can cut DNA internally. It will make a sequence specific nick between A prime and D. And then the cell polymerase will elongate from the nick to the left. So it will fill in that red part there. And now we have a completely double stranded molecule with both ends copied, right? So both hairpins at both ends are present as double-stranded DNA. These ends can then form hairpins, and one of the hairpins can serve as a initiation primer for DNA synthesis. It's now the new DNA is shown as orange, and we have strand displacement synthesis. So the polymerase is displacing the top strand. It's copying it fully copies the bottom one, shown all the way at the bottom here. And this one uh, on the, in the middle, the, this strand that was displaced, that will also be copied by priming at the three prime end of that hairpin as well. And so this bottom, for example, strand, double-stranded structure is essentially the same as the second one that we had here. So that can go through the DNA synthesis cycle over and over again. So we have Continuous DNA synthesis, there's no discontinuous synthesis at all because there's no lagging strand. There's displacement synthesis primed by uh, this uh, hairpin primer to begin with. Uh, and uh, the cell proteins, the cell polymerases do this, uh, this synthesis. There's no pole alpha because we don't need RNA primers. So we don't need pole alpha, but delta uh, and some other proteins are needed uh, to polymerize. And this rep protein is called 
Rep 7868 uh, is uh, is the endonuclease, and also the protein it binds the origin of replication. So that's functionally equivalent to the T antigen of SV40. So no end problem because the terminal repeats pre prevent loss of sequence during polymerization and the DNA itself is used as a primer. So that's another solution to the end problem and an example of strand displacement synthesis. Now getting bigger viral genomes, now we're moving up to adenovirus, longer double-stranded DNA. It has an origin of replication at each end. So as we're gonna see, the synthesis is gonna occur from, from both ends, and this is gonna be strand displacement also. All right, so this uh, priming of this DNA is done by a protein primer, a viral protein, uh, which is called TP, terminal protein. And so here is the overview on the right. We have a double-stranded uh, DNA, and the polymerase, which is shown in purple, is just starting to polymerize at the three prime end, very three prime end of the genome. And so what happens is um, the polymerase is bound to a precursor form of the terminal protein. It's called pre-TP. Uh, and um, the polymerase links a single C residue onto the terminal protein. That C base pairs with a G, which is four bases in from the three prime end, it begins to polymerize. It makes CAT, and then, as you can see, the GTA template is repeated so that polymerase can slip back three residues, so now it's not losing any DNA sequence when it's copying, and it continues to uh, synthesize the rest of the DNA. So why it cannot start at the very end is not clear. It's hard to start at the end of, of DNA without a, a primer. So this so solves the problem. You start a few bases in and then, then slip back. And RNA polymerases do the same thing. So that's the beginning. It's primed with a terminal protein. And then the terminal protein, by the way, is covalently linked to that C. So it ends up being on the viral DNA. If you extract uh, viral DNA from uh, virus particles has protein stuck on both ends. So now let's take the overview. The polymerase starts at the three prime end. It does strand displacement. It copies the bottom strand. The synthesis is in red there. Here's the polymerase in purple moving down. The top strand is being uh, displaced. And there is a, pro a viral protein, a DNA binding protein, the yellow, which binds the top strand to keep it single stranded, not to base pair with any other complements that might be in the cell. And eventually you get a fully double-stranded form uh, of the viral DNA with the blue and the red DNAs. Okay, so that's the cycle we're seeing there with the bottom strand. The top strand also is copied because remember, this is semi-conservative DNA replication. So the top strand has to be copied as well. There it is. It's all coated with, with DNA uh, binding protein except for the ends, which are base pair. They're, they also have inverted complementary repeats, so they can base pair and form uh, a little double-stranded structure, which looks exactly like the ends of the DNA. And so the polymerase will recognize it uh, and start at the three prime end. Remember the terminal proteins at the five prime end. It will recognize this double strand as looking at like the end of a DNA, like an origin and it will start to copy it as well. So here's the polymerase in red starting, uh, sorry, in purple, starting to copy that released strand. They put on a terminal protein as the primer. It's gonna copy the whole thing. We're gonna have another DNA, double-stranded DNA molecule, which could enter this whole cycle again. So both the bottom and the top strands are copied by strand displacement using a protein primer. The protein that binds the uh, DNA, the single-stranded DNA binding protein is is interesting in its structure, it's shown here. Remember the polymerase is doing strand displacement. It is moving along the bottom strand and the top strand is being displaced by the polymerase. And as that top strand comes off, this single stranded DNA binding protein binds to it. And that's the structure of it there on the left. It look, you know, the, the body is globular and it has this little protrusion which inserts into the double strand and helps to denature it as the polymerase is, mo is moving along. And our next question is, how is DNA replication of parvovirus and adenovirus similar? 
A, they both require protein-linked primers. B, replication occurs by strand displacement. C, synthesis, DNA synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm. D, a replication fork occurs in both or none of the above. How are they similar? Uh, they're similar in that replication occurs by strand displacement. Uh, they, don't, they don't both do protein primers. The parvos use a DNA primer built into the genome. Doesn't occur in the cytoplasm. Only the pox and the Mimi viruses, the really big ones, occur there. Uh, replication fork in both. They're both strand displacement. So that's why B is right. And, and so let's take a look because a lot of you didn't get this. Um, Protein-linked priming for adenovirus, strand displacement. And for parvoviruses, DNA primer, right? The three prime end of the viral DNA that's base paired with itself is the primer and also strand displacement. So strand displacement is what they have in common. Uh, moving even larger now, herpes simplex virus. So her, DNA, par, excuse me, adenovirus genome, about 34,000 base pairs of double-stranded DNA. Herpes viruses, 150 or so, 150,000 base pairs, so bigger. So the genome is shown here. So it's a long double-stranded DNA like uh, adenovirus, but longer. It has two origins, uh, three origins of replication. So two are called Ori S, they're the same, and Ori L is different. And you may say, why do you have three? Uh, well, probably they work in different kinds of tissues, different cell types in the host because there are different phases of herpes replication, as we'll see later. So three origins of replication. Uh, and there are a number of viral proteins that are encoded by the genome that participate in uh, DNA synthesis. We have primases, remember, that make the primers and make short DNA. We have a, a processivity protein, which helps the DNA polymerase move along, an origin binding protein, a single-stranded DNA binding protein like that of adenovirus and a DNA polymerase. Now, this DNA comes into the cell as a linear molecule. It's going to be converted to a circle and then replicate as a rolling circle. Let's see what that is. So there's our linear double-stranded DNA. It has repeated sequences within it, but they're not important for our discussion in case you're wondering what they are, TRL, TRS, et cetera. The DNA comes in. It, it is delivered in the nuclear capsid, docking on the nuclear pore. The DNA shoots into the nucleus and it's circularized by a ligase. A ligase is an enzyme that can join ends of DNA together, covalently join them. It's a cellular ligase there, so DNA ligase for it, and makes it circular. So host proteins circularize the DNA. And then it replicates by what we call rolling circle. So you start on the upper left, you have the viral DNA as it comes in the nucleus, an endonuclease, makes a nick in the DNA. That nick now provides a three prime hydroxyl at which point the DNA polymerase can use it as a primer and begin to copy the other strand. And so the red is the newly synthesized DNA being copied from the other strand. Here we'll call it the minus strand, it's light blue. And that copying begins to displace the top strand, the dark blue strand or uh, the plus strand here. So this is displacement synthesis. The red continues around the circle. As it does so, it displaces more and more of the top strand. And here on this image, we're looking at the top strand being displaced. And then DNA synthesis begins on it as well. So again, both strands are copied the minus strand and the plus strand. The synthesis on the top strand is discontinuous because it begins with a primer when a short part of the plus strand has been displaced. And then as more gets displaced, additional primers are added. It can't be continuous, right? Because you'd have to wait until you had a lot of the top strand displaced, and, and that doesn't happen. So primers are put down as soon as there is single strand available. 
and as the other strand synthesis continues, the circle continues to go around and around and around. You get more and more of that. Well, you get all the top strand eventually displaced, and then that's followed by newly synthesized top strand. Now, remember, the top strand here is blue, dark blue. That's the plus strand. And the red is newly synthesized plus strand. So eventually we displace all of the previously existing plus strand, and it's then joined to newly synthesized plus strand. So all the red and the blue, they're all plus strands, and discontinuous synthesis occurs on them, again, by synthesizing short RNA primers followed by synthesis of DNA. Eventually the RNA primers are removed, the gaps are filled in, and you have uh, a single strand of DNA, complementary DNA. So there's no end problem here because there's no end. We're using a circle as the template. Finally, pox viruses are different from what we've discussed so far because these viruses replicate in the cytoplasm. All the viruses we've talked about so far today replicate in the nucleus. Pox viruses do not. They reproduce they replicate their DNA in the cytoplasm. Therefore, they have to encode all the proteins needed for DNA replication because in the cell, the DNA synthesis machinery, of course, is localized to the nucleus. So pox viruses need to encode everything on their own. And now the genome of pox virus is unusual. It is a long double-stranded DNA where the ends are covalently joined. There's no free five prime and three prime ends, those have been covalently closed or chemically closed. And here's an experiment to show you the synthesis of pox virus DNA in the cytoplasm in what we call factories. They're areas of concentrated DNA synthesis. So we have three immunofluorescent images here. On the left, this is a single cell that's stained with DAPI, which is a dye that stains DNA. And you can see the cell nucleus is very clear. It fluoresces very bright. It's, it's very sharply demarcated. And outside of it where is the cytoplasm, of course, there's also some DNA staining. Uh, and so some of that could be mitochondrial, of course, but not all of it. In the second panel, we have stained this infected cell with an antibody to the vaccinia virus or pox virus DNA binding protein. So it's a protein involved in DNA replication, and you can see it's fluorescing red. And these red dots appear to be in the cytoplasm because you can see the dark area where the nucleus was in the previous image. And in the third, we merge the blue and the red images, and we can now see that the nucleus, the nuclear DNA, has no DNA binding protein in it. All the DNA binding protein is in the cytosol where it co-localizes with some of that DNA. So pox virus DNA factories where the replication occurs are located in the cell nucleus. The way that pox virus DNA replicates isn't as well worked out. As for the other viruses that we've talked about today, here's what we think happens. Again, the virus encodes all the proteins it needs to replicate its DNA, about 15 viral proteins that are made in the cytoplasm, and they establish cytoplasmic factories for DNA synthesis. We think that the first RNA primers for DNA synthesis are synthesized near one end of the viral genome. Remember, it's a single uh, genome, double-stranded, where the ends are covalently linked. So these green areas show you the RNA primers followed by DNA polymerization. So the RNA primers, of course, are primers for the DNA polymerase, and then the polymerase simply begins to copy those uh, all the way around the single strand. You end up with a dimer. You can think of the genome as a monomer, it's, it's basically one strand if you separated it, if you denatured it. And so now what we have done is we have copied that first strand all the way around. We make a dimer. And then the two strands, of course, have to separate to make two new genomes or one new genome and one original genome. And so how that happens, it 
isn't exactly known. It's called concatamer resolution. Nevertheless, there's no end problem because this is a circle very much like SV40 DNA. Let's talk a little bit about viral origins of replication. We've talked about these for polyomaviruses and papillomaviruses, parvoviruses, adenoviruses, and herpes viruses. Uh, some of these genomes have one, uh, some have two, the adenovirus has two, and the herpes virus has three origins. These are generally AT-rich segments that are recognized by proteins called viral origin recognition proteins, and they are the assembly points for multi-protein DNA replication machines. Here are three viral origins in some detail. We have SV40, the uh, one of the herpes simplex viruses origins, and one of the two adenovirus origins. So you can see SV40, here's the core origin delineated by the arrow. It contains sequences bound by large T, LT. Those are these yellow areas here. Uh, that's where large T antigen binds. Uh, and then it also contains AT-rich sequences in the green. And AT-rich sequences are significant because these are base pairs that are easier to melt than GC base pairs. A GC base pair is stronger than an AT base pair. And so because the origin needs to be melted in order to allow DNA synthesis to begin, it makes sense to have AT-rich sequences in there to make that job easier. And then finally, these origins are typically next to promoters. And so here we have binding sites for transcriptional regulators, which are part of promoters, as we discussed before. Then we have the OREL of herpes simplex 1. Again, the core origin here uh, shown by these two arrows. We have binding sites for the origin recognition proteins. We have AT-rich sequences and uh, transcriptional regulator binding sites for two promoters going in opposite directions from the origin. And finally, the uh, origin for adenovirus is the end of the DNA. One of There are two, because there are two ends. This is one of the two. Uh, the yellow, the sequence is bound by the origin recognition protein, uh, which is shown here. The terminal protein is bound, but of course, the, it's the, the pre-terminal protein that originally uh, binds to the end. So that's the origin recognition protein. And we have AT-rich sequences and then binding site for transcriptional regulators. Origin recognition proteins that we've talked about include the large T antigen of polyomaviruses, which binds specifically to DNA. There it is shown in red and recruits the DNA replication machinery of the host cell in the form of cellular replication proteins. The Rep6878 of parvovirus binds at the ends and uh, unwinds the DNA and recruits the DNA synthesis machinery of the host. The preterminal protein uh, of adenovirus binds at the terminus of the DNA and recruits the DNA polymerase. It's the viral replication protein there in the, in the purple triangle. And the herpes virus UL9 protein uh, recruits viral proteins to the origin. So again, it's, that's the red protein there binding to the origin and helps unwind the DNA. For pox virus, the uh, viral replication proteins uh, are recruited to the viral DNA in the cytoplasm. There's no need to recruit the cellular apparatus because the, the apparatus is all viral. Uh, origin binding proteins have similar structures. Here are structures of three uh, AAV5, that's a parvovirus, that's the rep protein, uh, the bovine papillomavirus E1, and the SV40 large T. You can see they all have this multi stranded, uh, multi beta stranded sheet structure with uh, alpha helices surrounding it. Looks very similar. And, the AAV5 rep, of course, in addition, has an active site because it's also an endonuclease, and the active site is shown there for nicking the DNA, as we talked about. So these are most likely evolved from a common ancestor. SV40 large T is most likely the best studied protein on the planet. It is 708 amino acids in length, and every one of those amino acids have been changed and the protein studied 
with respect to its function. And the different functional domains on SV40 large T are shown here. For example, the nuclear localization signal, which is needed to get this protein back in the nucleus where it participates in viral DNA synthesis. Here's the sequence of the protein that binds the origin of SV40 DNA. Here is the sequence for helicase activity. Uh, here is a sequence for binding Paul alpha, uh, one of the polymerases involved in DNA synthesis. And here is a sequence bind that binds RB protein, retinoblastoma protein, whose role we're going to talk about in a moment. Now, we call SV40 large T a species specific uh, DNA binding protein or origin binding protein, it means the same thing to us. And that is because pre initiation complexes do not form in the wrong species. So, this SV40 stands for simian virus 40, uh, the virus infects primate cells, but it won't, for example, infect mouse cells. And that's because the T antigen of SV40 does not interact with the Paul alpha primase in the mouse cell. And that's an essential part for getting viral DNA synthesis going. T antigen binding to DNA and then interacting with Paul alpha primase, and it simply doesn't occur in the wrong species. The other important property of SV40 large T is that it binds and sequesters cell cycle regulators and causes cells to enter S phase. And this is an important property that I want to talk about a little bit now. Now, most of the cells in our body are not dividing. There are some that are constantly dividing. The epithelial cells that line our respiratory and gastrointestinal tracts, for example, are constantly dividing, but most of our other cells are not. Muscle cells are not. Heart cells, brain cells, liver cells, uh, unless there's a need for regeneration, they're not dividing. And so viruses, especially DNA viruses that we're talking about today, they don't replicate well in quiescent cells. Why not? Because a cell that's not dividing is not making the DNA synthesis machinery. So it's not available for the viral genome. So the solution to this problem is that when DNA viruses enter a quiescent cell, they induce the synthesis of host replication proteins by making the cells divide. And that is done by the early proteins that are encoded in the viral genome. So here is a picture of the cell cycle, a roughly 24-hour cycle uh, that cells undergo, a small part of which is devoted to actually splitting one cell into two, which is called mitosis. That's the red part here. But the rest of the cycle is devoted to preparing for mitosis. For example, there is after mitosis occurs, there is a a portion called G1, which is growth one, and yeah, the cell's growing because once you've split, you've divided the cytosol, and you have to make it larger again. Then there's a period of called S during which replication of DNA occurs. You have to double the amount of DNA, of course, so that when the cells split, they each get half. Uh, and, and then finally, there's more growth, the G2 phase, before the actual cell division. Now, the cycle is highly regulated. I told you just previously that most cells in our body are not dividing. Well, that's because cell division is highly regulated. And a key regulator of cell division is the RB protein, which can arrest the cell cycle right here in G1 at what's called a restriction point. The RB protein is encoded by a cellular gene called the RB gene. It was originally discovered in children who have tumors of their retinoblasts. And RB controls entry into S. The RB can dictate whether the cell cycle will continue into S or whether it stops right there. And in kids with retinal, retinal tumors, they have lost the gene encoding RB protein. And so there's no longer any restriction in division of those retinoblasts, 
And they, the cells keep dividing and dividing, and eventually they sustain enough mutations that they become a cancer. So RB is a tumor suppressor gene, and we'll talk more about that in a couple of sessions. So how does RB control the cell cycle? Well, uh, here on the very right uh, is schematized a, a DNA with, with a promoter, and imagine that there are multiple promoters uh, that are encoding genes that are needed for the cell to divide, needed for DNA synthesis and to pass through the cell cycle. Those promoters, the promoters of those genes are controlled by transcriptional regulatory regions. Uh, and one of the sets of proteins that binds to these promoters involved in cell division now are, are two transcriptional regulators called E2F and DP. And normally those will bind these promoters and facilitate transcription of genes involved in cell division and the cell will go through mitosis. When these two proteins are bound, bound to RB protein, which is shown in olive color there, that presence of RB inhibits transcription at these promoters, at these promoters of genes needed for cell division. The way RB does that, we've actually seen not too long ago, RB recruits histone deacetylases, which tightens up the chromatin and shuts down transcription. Now, for the cell to undergo division, it needs to abrogate this inhibition, and it can do so by phosphorylating RB. There are kinases associated with uh, RB that phosphorylate it. The RB comes off of the E2F-DP complex, and now the, the promoter's active and the cells undergo division. Viruses do a similar thing. They bump RB off of this E2F-DP complex by virtue of these early viral proteins like SV40 large T, adenovirus E1A, and the E7 protein of papillomaviruses. So they're shown in pink here. Those proteins bind RB, they knock it off E2F and DP, and these promoters can now become active. And so when one of these viruses enters a quiescent cell that's not dividing, Remember, the first protein that's made is large T or E1A. That protein goes into the nucleus, binds RB, and turns on the genes that the transcription of genes needed for cell division. The cell begins to divide. DNA synthesis proteins are made, and now the viral genome can be replicated. So it is a really interesting way that the viral genome uh, assures the environment to be replicated. Now, that's going to factor in when we talk about cancers in a couple of weeks. Because remember, if these viral proteins can make the cell divide, if they do it forever, then those cells can become a cancer. Monday, we are going to talk about the last set of viral genomes in terms of their reproduction and that is the retroviruses and hepatinoviruses where reverse transcription and sometimes integration is involved in viral replication.